introduce Ray Winslow, the Raj and Nira Singh Professor of Biomedical Engineering, the Director of the Institute for Computational Medicine and Center for Cardiovascular Bioinformatics and Modeling. Ray will talk about applying computational medicine to real-time data from patients. Mute and start video and share my screen. Okay. So I hope my screen is being shared at this point. There we go. Yep, it's coming through. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay. So I'm talking about AI in medicine, and I'd like to begin with a comment about the old and the new meaning of the phrase artificial intelligence, AI. Artificial intelligence was a term first coined by the giants of the field, Marvin Minsky and Seymour Papert in the early 1960s, and it referred to um, efforts to understand and quantify and model on the computer human decision-making and human intelligence. Uh, and, and the more modern definition of the term, however, has become a bit more narrow. And it now refers um, very much to methods of machine learning and statistical learning, that is to say, methods by which large data sets can be analyzed using statistical procedures to discover knowledge uh, and to make predictions. And so that's the sense in which we use the term artificial intelligence, and it's becoming a huge part of medicine. And I want to show you an example of why that is. And here we have an image of a patient in a critical care unit. And it's very intimidating to see this if this is a member of your family because this patient is surrounded by a lot of equipment and there are a lot of sensors and wires coming from the patient going to the equipment. And the challenge for critical care physicians is to um, deal with the huge variety of data coming from patients in critical care units uh, by that, I mean there's many different kinds of data that are collected, blood pressures, intracranial pressures, heart rates, uh, oxygenation levels of blood, many other kinds of information. So it's a lot of different types of data. The data come in very fast. Uh, the slowest at which they come in is roughly minute by minute, and it can be even at millisecond by millisecond. And the data is complex because it's physiologic data that fundamentally informs us in a very real way about the physiologic state of this patient. Um, and our physician colleagues tell us it is extremely challenging to deal with these three issues, the issues of data variety, volume, and complexity. Uh, and they do well at it, but they say we really need help in dealing with these issues in order to understand what's going on with our patients. And so I want to give you an example about how modern art intelligent, artificial intelligence methods can help critical care physicians in particular uh, deal with this. And what I find so interesting about this work is that in our view, critical care physicians and maybe even physicians in general, every time they see their patient, they ask three questions fundamentally. What is the state of my patient? How will their state change how do I treat them? How do I anticipate what's going to happen and treat them? Uh, and this is critically important in intensive care medicine because um, the state of a patient can change very quickly and for the worse. And so physicians need help in identifying when the state of their patient might change and in choosing treatments. And so we believe that methods of artificial intelligence can help in answering these questions, these method builds on the availability of large annotated clinical data sets. Annotated means that these are carefully obtained, precise records of what was going on with the patient. In our examples, it, uh, data refers to both information from the electronic health record, as well as what's called vital signs data collected every single minute from a patient when they were in the critical care unit. 
and we'll talk more about the specific data types later. And they're very large. There's lots of data available for each patient, and there can be large numbers of patients. And we know what happened to these patients. I'm going to be talking about retrospective studies. So we know what was wrong with them, when, when these events happened, uh, and when they got sick. And we want to harness machine learning me methods to help physicians understand how to make better decisions about these patients. And then we want to put these methods into practice to assess their value. And so now let's get specific about the problem that I want to talk about. It's the problem of patients with sepsis and predicting those patients with sepsis who are very likely to go into sept septic shock. Why do we care about this problem? Well, sepsis is a very serious disease. It's a system-wide severe infection. It results in reduced blood pressure, uh, reduced organ perfusion. Uh, it can lead to organ failure and possible death. It's an, a hugely important disease in the United States and throughout the world. A stunning statistic is that 30 to 50% of all hospital deaths in the US are a result from sepsis and septic shock. It is the most expensive disease to treat in the United States. The cumulative costs of all of the patients who are treated for septics is the, is the leading uh, healthcare expense. And it's the leading cause of hospital readmissions as well. Now, septic shock is a particularly severe kind of sepsis in which organ failure is already occurring and patients are at high risk for death. We now know that for every hour of delayed treatment, for every hour that, that physicians don't recognize that a patient is in septic shock, mortality increases 8%. That's a rather staggering number. We also know that procedures like early goal-directed therapy saves lives, and these are relatively simple procedures. They involve giving vasopressors to increase blood pressure, fluid administration to help increase blood pressure, giving antibiotics, multiple antibiotics, changing the menu of antibiotics that patients are given. These are known as early goal-directed therapies. They're known to save lives. The more quickly they can be done, the more lives can be saved. So if we can find a way to identify patients with sepsis who are likely to develop septic shock, and if we can make that prediction before they go into shock, there's something physicians can do. They can apply these early goal-directed therapies to treat these patients. So this is our goal, and this is how we think about it. Now, on the x-axis um, is time, and on the y-axis, there is something called a risk score. The blue squiggly line is made up, it's just an example, and it illustrates the risk score, which is a number that goes from zero to one, and you can think of it as a percentage. And this is this inch percentage. This risk score is telling us the likelihood that at any given moment in time, a patient with sepsis will, at some time point in the future, transition to septic shock. So it ranges from zero to one or zero to 100%. Now you see these labels over the time axis that say clinical state sepsis, clinical state septic shock. This is an example of data from uh, a retrospective study where we know that during this time interval, the patient was clinically diagnosed by current standards as being in sepsis. We know that during over this later time window shown in the deeper red, the patient was in septic shock. And the core idea of our work is that if patients are going to transition to septic shock, they have sepsis, then that means they're getting sicker. And therefore, over time, the risk that they're going into shock may increase. And our goal is the following. We want to find a smart way of computing this risk score. We want to compare at any moment in time the risk score to a threshold theta. And we ask the question, is there a theta? such that if the risk score is greater than that theta, and we decide when that event occurs that this is a patient who's going into septic shock, can we find a theta where those calls can be made reliably? In other words, if the patient's risk goes above a certain threshold value of theta, um, we're gonna say they're going into septic shock at some time point in the future. Is there a theta for which we can make that call very reliably very accurately? The answer is yes. I'll talk about it in just a minute. 
Um, and so another thing to note in this diagram is that when we make that call, we want to make it ahead of time. The patient is still in sepsis. And if we can make this call hours ahead of time before they go into what is clinically recognized as septic shock, then there's a time window over which physicians can intervene to help their patient. Notice what's happening to the risk score over this time window. I've drawn it as increasing gradually, gradually, and the interpretation is the patient gets sicker and sicker. This was an early example that I drew before we had done this work, and I want you to keep the gradual rate of change in my hypothetical risk score in mind as I go through some other slides, because we'll see this is not how things really work. Things work differently than what I'm showing here. And that's one of the most important things we've found. So I'm now gonna talk about features, risk models, and decisions, and I'll be clear about what, first of all, features are. Features are the things we measure from patients. So for example, blood lactate level, a score called the cardiovascular uh, sequential organ failure assessment score. It's a number that can be measured uh, at specific time intervals for uh, patients. Glasgow coma score, heart rate, blood oxygen levels, and other things. These are things we measure from patients. The important aspect of, of this is that these are numbers. They're all numbers that we measure from patients. We're calling them the features, and we'll label them this vector X. Now, what's the risk model? The risk model is the function that takes these features that we measure moment by moment from patients and turns those features by putting them through a function into a number. That's the risk score value. It's the probability that this patient with sepsis is going into septic shock at some future time. And we have a principled way of learning this from the data. That's the AI method of learning this from the data. Um, the features, which are numbers, just get weighted by other numbers and added together and then put through this function. And the magic is finding the beta value, the weights that make this risk score accurate. And there are principled ways of doing this. So we make decisions when the risk score exceeds this threshold I've talked about. That's when we make the call. This patient is going into shock. So here's an example of of performance of this method as studied over thousands of patients. So the way we do this is we build the predictive models from looking at thousands of, of patient data sets. We then take and we learn the models from that. We then take entirely new data sets, not ones involved in the learning process, and test our ability to make predictions. And so to summarize this finding in a simple way, we can correctly detect 88% of the time the sepsis patients who will transition to septic shock. It is true that we miss some of them, but we do quite well in finding 88% of the patients who will transition. When we make the call that the risk score has exceeded the threshold and that a patient is going into shock, we can assign a patient-specific reliability score to that call. Formally, this is known as positive predictive value. And we've shown how this, this reliability score can be as high as 90%. Now, of course, it can be low as well. It might be 20 or 30%. But the important thing here is that when we make this call, we tell the physician, we believe your patient is going into shock at some time point in the future. And here is the confidence we have in that call. And it can be as high as 90%. Looking over thousands of patients, we make this call on average seven hours before patients actually do go into shock. So we can provide a long many hour window over which patient, uh, physicians rather can intervene. Now here's one of my final slides. We used a method of uh, analyzing these, these risk score profiles over time called uh, spectral clustering to ask the question, are there distinct groupings of these risk scores over time? And so we lined them all up at the time where we made, the, these are all patients who went into shock. Um, they're all lined up at time zero, which is the time we make the call. And the important thing to note here is that before this call is made, the risk score looks the same for all the patients. The second important thing to note is that when the patients are getting sick and when threshold is crossed, look how rapidly the risk score change changes. It, it changes in, 
in less than an hour. It changes in the order of 30 minutes from something low to something very high. And then once that change has occurred and we've made the call, these patients are going into shock, patients stratify, in this case, into four different groups. One of these groups has very high probability of going into shock. 77% of them do. 43% of them die from septic shock. Whereas for the lowest risk group, 10% uh, of them go into shock. 18% of them die. Now, there's some other interesting numbers in this plot. If you look at the lower risk group and, and look what happens as you move to the high risk group, the low risk group, at the time this call was made, 51% of them had been treated with vasopressors. 21% of them had been adequately fluid resuscitated. So these are some treatments for septic shock. They're already getting them. But as you progress to the high mortality group, look, there's this systematic change. Fewer and fewer of these patients are being treated with vasopressors. Fewer and fewer are getting adequate fluid resuscitation. So perhaps it's no surprise that there is a high mortality group where you're very, very likely to go into septic shock. So once we observe data from patients, we can, on making this call, sort them into these different groups and tell a physician, oh, your patient may be in the high mortality group or your patient is in the lower mortality group. Again, very important information that we want to provide physicians. So I know this is a very restricted example, but um, I believe that this paradigm covers almost everything, every kind of decision that physicians make um, urgently in critical care medicine. And it's an example of AI and medicine in general. And it shows that we can predict patients accurately with sepsis who will transition to shock, we can do it in advance, and we can sort them into different risk categories. Um, we provide enough of an early warning that there's ample time for caregivers to step in and do something about it, for example, by providing early goal-directed therapy. This is very important. We've shown for the first time that this transition from sepsis to shock is extremely rapid. It happens over about a 30-minute time scale. It's so fast that we believe its detection requires real-time computational monitoring. Other kinds of monitoring aren't going to reveal this. And I think it's fascinating to think about why this might happen. I think what is happening is that uh, prior to threshold crossing, the body is able to somehow fight off an infection and prevent the patient from getting worse. But then I think there's some sort of bifurcation. There's some collapse of the ability of the body to fight infection and these Patients just get bad very, very, very quickly. And it would be fascinating to follow that up and find out what's the biology behind this rapid transition. And finally, we show that patients can be separated into high versus low risk groups, and we can quickly and reliably sort patients into these groups so that physicians are aware of what is going on with their patients and their risk for mortality, and that can guide and inform their treatment. So uh, I hope this has been an illustrative example uh, showing you about AI and medicine. Thanks, and I'm happy to take questions. Great. Thank you very much, Ray. Um, we're a little over time, so I'm just going to ask two quick questions. Well, one is from Cynthia Saber, who asks whether it is the machine that decides the weight of the variables that you're plugging into your metric. There is a principled way of choosing those parameters. So the answer is yes. There's an optimal algorithm for choosing those betas, the weights that make that risk score predictive. Great, thank you. And then Peter Weiss asks, regarding the ability that you've developed to predict 88% of the patients that will go into shock, is that based on patients only at Johns Hopkins or is the pool of people distributed more widely geographically? Oh, it's more widely. It's based on patients at Johns Hopkins as well as um, about half a million patients from a large recently released public database. It's called the EICU database. And it's also been done with uh, information from another database called MIMIC that's uh, available from a group at Harvard. And so the methods have been built on one set of data and tested on others, completely independent sets of data um, using these sources. Uh, the EICU database in particular collects data from over 100 different hospitals and the models built using data from hundreds of hospitals works very well as well. And so this is not hospital specific data, it's 
a very general result. Sometimes the models are built from hundreds of different locations. Splendid. Thank you very much, Ken.